هم میخورم امشب وقتی دستای کچیکیشو بالا بیارم برا همه همون تمومه Say the Lord Salawat. At this point, I would request, my usual request, to all the brothers who are sitting, to please move forward. We have to make sure that we have space available, and please also make sure that as no men are sitting uh, in Bidatma Binte uh, Talmiz Hussain, Talmiz Hussain Rizvi. So if we're there, Isal al-Sawab, and for the Isal al-Sawab of all of our marhumeen, recite the Surah Fatiha with a very loud salawah. Allahumma salli ala Allah. I would now request Hujjat al-Islam, Malana Sayyid Suleiman Hassan Abdi, to come to the member Please recite a very loud salawat. Allahumma salli Muhammad Surah Al-Fatiha بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين المبعوث رحمة للعالمين شفيع المذنبين وحبيب قلوب الصادقين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على وعلى أهل بيته الأطيبين الأطهرين الهداة المهديين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل رقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في القرآن المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألا إن أولياء الله لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون الذين آمنوا وكانوا يتقون صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Yesterday we began our commemoration of the sacrifice and the martyrdom of our beloved Imam, the grandson and the heir of Islam and of the Prophet of Islam. The living Quran and the personification of all of the highest ideals of humanity that we are familiar with and the greatest role model and example for all of our believing 
men and women. Sayyid al-Shuhada Imam Hussain ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhim as salatu was salam. And one point that I made, and I'm going to repeat it today, and I'm repeating it for a very specific reason, is that we sometimes feel that there is a conflict between the history of what took place in Karbala and the commemoration and the poetry and the different types of cultural and customary ways that we remember the events of Karbala. Now, the reason why I'm repeating this is because there are specific questions that I have sometimes experienced myself, sometimes I've heard from others. One is that I read a story that quotes historical reports, and those historical reports were somewhat different from what I heard in the majlis. And because there is a difference, then I lost my connection to the majlis. I've heard people actually say that I'm not going to come back to a particular gathering because the speaker read a narration that is different from what I am familiar with. Now, maybe that narration actually is accurate or equally authentic or more authentic than what I might have read. I probably read it in some book, in translation maybe, or maybe in Arabic, from some source. And there might be other sources or other narrations that are different from what I read. But assuming for the sake of argument that I have access to the closest to the authentic narration, we sometimes feel that there is a tension or a conflict. And sometimes people they come to a particular reciter of poetry and they say that, why did you recite that? Or a speaker, why did you recite this particular narration? They feel a negativity, sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad or ahadi Muhammad. They feel a negativity towards the traditional commemorations because of that quest for accuracy. And yesterday I mentioned that that quest for accuracy can never be perfect. Because what can a historian see but the superficial element of what is taking place? If you were to go to a historian, then Imam Hussain and his company were utterly vanquished. And there could be no more clear, convincing victory from a superficial sense, from a military sense, than the victory of Yazid. But with Karbala, that is not the most important part of what took place. In fact, the military battle is the least important part of what took place. If I want to just give an example so the point can become clear, imagine that you have a friend, a family member, who has suffered a tragic loss within their own family. Let's say it's a friend whose mother or whose grandmother or whose father or grandfather has passed away. And you go to offer them condolences. And you really love that friend. You have a connection with that friend. You feel their happiness as if it's your own happiness. And you feel their sadness as if it is your own sadness. You are close, not just a formality. And then when you go and you offer your condolences, you might hug that friend. They say, you know, my mother was the sweetest person who ever lived. She never raised her voice at anybody. Whenever anybody would need help, she would always be the first one to say yes. Now at that moment, are you going to look in your memory, in your history, and say, well, actually, there was one time 15 years ago, I called her for help, and your mother said that she was busy. She didn't help me. Are you going to judge objectively whether she was the sweetest mother or whether maybe other mothers were more generous, more kind, more sweet to their children than she was? 
It's not that there is going to be a separate time where you'll say, this is going to be the primary importance for me. The purpose of that condolence, of that offering your sympathies, of coming to your friend, is not to judge the superficial or the objective facts of the life of that person's loved one. The purpose of that is to honor that relationship. And if that loved one was the sweetest mother or grandmother for that person, then you're not going to be cut off from that person and say, I lost interest in the condolence call because he said that his mother was the sweetest mother and I know that she was not Ma'asum and the best person who ever walked on the face of the earth. She was a good woman, but not the best. See what I'm trying to say? There is a reality and an objective reality. And if I am talking about my own children, my own family, my own loved ones, I should not falsify what I know to be true in order to honor them. But at the same time, there is a different priority that comes above just the facts and the details and the history and the superficial chronology of what took place. If when you go to offer your condolences to somebody, those facts get in the way of you being able to see, to offer your sympathy, then something is wrong with you. You have to look within your soul and see why is it that you don't have that very innate human sense of sympathy for somebody who is going through a loss. Or if you are the one who is suffering that loss, if it is present for you, sometimes we have loved ones, we find out that they have passed away. And there might be a time when we're going to want to find out the details of how it was that they lost their life. Was it a prolonged illness? Was it something that was sudden and unexpected? But if you suffer a loss at the moment, then you feel as if your feet are not firmly planted on the ground. You don't immediately say that, well, let me see all of the details. When did they begin to become weak? When did the doctor order this treatment? When did they hook up a ventilator? That is not your primary concern if you are the one who has suffered a loss. But what is the concern? Your love for that loved one. The depth of your loss and that relationship you have with other people who are also suffering that same separation and that loss. That is what comes primarily to your mind at that time. And so in Muharram, especially during these 10 days, as I said in the hadith of our 8th Imam, Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Rida alayhi salatu was salam, you are both coming for condolences to somebody who has suffered a loss. And you are sahib al aza you are the person who has suffered the loss. It is not the father of Sakina who was martyred, but it was your father and your imam. It was not the children of Lady Zainab who were martyred, but it was our children. We are suffering that loss and we are here to commemorate and to honor and to remember with a community that is also undergoing that loss. Now, some of those facts that seem to be so controversial, so important, do we see how they lose their pre priority and their preeminence? Not that we ever falsify. Not that we ever try to say something which is not true. But that is what we are trying to do and we are focusing on during these nights. And if I am not able to do that, then I have to reconnect to the purpose of this commemoration. 
shouldn't be something that is a conflict. Now, when we want to connect to Karbala, I said that we're going to try to examine how it is that the story of Karbala, but more generally the life of Imam Hussain and the example of Ahlul Bayt can be a solution for us in the crises that we have in our own lives, especially our spiritual crises. And the first question that comes to our mind is that should we determine what those crises are based on our feelings or our intellect or what mechanism do I have to know what is a crisis? All of us, we sometimes have certain things that we think are a big deal. And there are other things that we don't think are a very big deal. And as I mentioned yesterday, sometimes it's a symptom that I'm ready to ignore. But an expert, when they see that same physical symptom, they say you need to go to a hospital and you need to have tests performed immediately. I would ignore it because I don't know any better. But that person who is an expert will say that this is serious. And there might be other times that I think something is very important, like our children sometimes. But from our more experienced eyes, we realize that those terrible conflicts, they also are part of life. When people get married, then one real important uh, obstacle to cross and one very important milestone in a marriage is the first fight. Because there is nobody who can get married and spend a lifetime together and never have a disagreement. If you have that kind of a marriage or that kind of a relationship, it might not even be a blessing. It probably means that you are not fully invested and you are not fully present. And by not ever having a disagreement, there is much that you are missing out on because you're not putting yourself into the relationship. But sometimes people who don't have that experience, they think that, well, how am I ever going to overcome this? How am I ever going to resolve this? It seems like a massive issue, a very big crisis. When in reality, it might not be that big a deal. It might be the exact same fight, the exact same disagreement that every other husband and wife or every other group of people has experienced in a similar position. Parents will have disagreements about how to raise their children. Husbands and wives will have disagreements about how to deal with relatives and friends and finances and all of those normal issues that come within life. Is it a big deal or is it not a big deal? And the key point that I want us to begin to give some thought to not just during this majlis and the few minutes that we are together, but throughout our life, is the most important way that we can determine what is a crisis and what is not, what is important and what is not, is not by referring to yourself. Because we are still in the process of learning and growing. But it is by finding an example who has gone through all of those different paths, all of those different journeys, all of those different stages of life, and has attained the human perfection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given as a bounty to the Prophet and his progeny. Those examples and role models are to be the standard for us to see what is a crisis and what is not. Something that might to me seem like a very big hurdle, an insurmountable hurdle in my life. If I look at the Prophet, and I see he didn't give it a second thought. If I look at Lady Fatima, and I see that she didn't give it a second thought. If I look at our Imams, and I see that for them, they took it in stride, or they wore it as 
a badge of honor, then I shouldn't treat it as a crisis, but I should try to work to bring my preferences and my desires in line with the values, the priorities, the perceptions of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as-salatu wa salam. And vice versa. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now the flip side is also true. There might be something that to me it doesn't seem to be that important. But for Ahlul Bayt, it was a big deal. I overslept. I didn't wake for Salat al-Fajr. I say that, well, I was busy last night. I wasn't sinning. I was working or I was with my family or I was doing something halal. I overslept. and It's not a sin for me that I didn't deliberately miss my prayer. And that's true. But is that just a passing incident? I missed Fajr? Or is it a crisis? Is it something that should give me pause? Well, in my life, I might not give it a second thought. Some of us, we forget to even make up the prayers that we have missed. Because it's such a casual thing. I'll make it up later. And we get busy with our day. But we have to go back to Ahlul Bayt and measure that would they have been concerned? Would they have been worried? Would they have made drastic changes in their life because of that one simple, small, seemingly insignificant issue? And so I will say, this is a crisis. This is important, even if it doesn't feel that way to me. So that is what it means to measure ourselves according to Ahlul Bayt. If I'm not convinced that Ahlul Bayt are a worthy example, to give them precedence to even my own emotions, to give them precedence to even my own perceptions and my own intellect, then you need to become familiar with their lives. You need to become familiar with what the Prophet said about them. Where the Prophet would turn to his daughter Fatima Zahra Salamullah alayha. And he would say that whoever makes her angry makes me angry. Whoever makes me angry makes Allah angry. Man aghdabaha faqad aghdabani wa man aghdabani faqad aghdab Allah. Her emotional state is a perfect reflection of the emotional state of the Prophet. And the Prophet had to add the next sentence because there are some Muslims who brought the Prophet down as well. They said, well, the Prophet got mad sometimes and he would speak in anger and then he would repent for his anger. No. The anger of the Prophet, the pleasure of the Prophet, was a perfect reflection of the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the highest heavens. And so when the Prophet raises Ahlul Bayt, his daughter, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussain, and says that, Ana minhum wa hum minni. They are from me, I am from them. They are I and I am they. They are one with me and I am one with them. That means that they are a standard that we are to give precedence even to ourselves. There was a very famous companion of our fifth and our sixth imam by the name of Aban ibn Taghlib. And he was one of the fuqaha, one of the very pious people in the time of the Imams. Sometimes when we look at the lives of the Imams because we have a ma'asum in our sight, we don't give sufficient importance to those who were companions of the Imam and how important personalities they were for the spread of Islam. Imam Ja'far al-Sabiq alayhi salatu was salam When he would refer to his special companions, he would say to them that هم أمناء الله على حلاله وحرامه They are God's trustees over his laws and halal and haram. So the companions of our imams and their heirs, our ulama, our maraj, those who have devoted their lives to Islam, they're not ma'asub. 
And as followers of Ahlul Bayt, we have been saved from making a hero out of anybody beyond what they are worthy of. Knowing and recognizing the Ma'asumin has saved us from having to idealize national heroes or sports heroes or celebrities or even good people and pious people above what they were actually worthy of. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't recognize what they are worthy of. Aban ibn Taghlib was somebody who Imam Baqir said that when I am alive and I am in Masjid al Madina, I want to see you issue fatwas. So these Muslims, Sunni and Shia and all who are present, they will know that among my followers and among my companions is somebody like you. So he was somebody who would issue fatwas in the presence of Imam Muhammad al Baqir and Imam Ja'far al Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam. His kunya or his title was Abu Sa'id. So a person came to him when he was sitting in the masjid and said that, Ya Aba Sa'id, kam shahida ma amir al mu'minin min ashabi Rasulullah. How many of the companions of the Prophet were with Imam Ali during his battles? Imam Ali had a very controversial period of government. During his period of government, many Muslims were confused. They said, on one side we have Amir al-Mu'mineen and we know him to be Akhu Rasulullah wa ibn Ammi Rasulullah wa Zawju ibn Rasulullah. He is the brother of the Prophet. He is the cousin of the Prophet. He is one of the earliest Muslims, the best Muslim, the son-in-law of the Prophet. But on the other side we have the wife of the Prophet, we have prominent companions. And so this person came to Aba and he said, Kam shahida ma'a Ali ibn Abi Talib? Or kam shahida ma'a Amir al-Mu'mineen min ashabi Rasulullah? How many of the companions of the Prophet were with Imam Ali in his battles? And so Aba looked at him and he was a scholar of hadith and history and Quran and fiqh and he would have been able to give the answer. But he said, I think you're asking this question because you want to gauge the legitimacy of Imam Ali by finding out how many of the companions of the Prophet were with him. And he said, that is what I am asking you for. Aban says, you're asking wrong. You want to gauge which companions of the Prophet you can trust by seeing were they with Imam Ali or were they opposing Imam Ali. If they were on this side of the battlefield, then they are companions of the Prophet. If they were on that side of the battlefield, whoever they might be, they were traitors to the Prophet and traitors to Islam. You don't judge Imam Ali by saying he had tens of companions of Prophet on his side. He had hundreds of companions of the Prophet on his side. You judge those companions by saying that Uthman ibn Hunayf, Ammar ibn Yasir, these people were honored because they were with Imam Ali. And those who were not with Imam Ali, they were not worthy of being followed. So, Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The point is that Ahlul Bayt والسلام, are a standard. And we have to be able to understand that standard so that some things that don't seem important to me but were important to Ahlul Bayt gradually become important to me. We often get desensitized and we get distant because of our work lives and all of the other distractions that we have within our life. And some things that seem important to me should not be so important to me. One thing that many people talk about, which is very important to them, and a constant hurdle between them and connecting with their community, is they sometimes say that, you know, Muslims or Shia Muslims or our fellow community members are often not the most courteous or the most friendly of people. I don't know if you've ever heard that complaint or felt that complaint, that one day I went to buy a car and I saw there was a Muslim salesman and I said, well, let me go to the Muslim. 
And so another salesman came to me and said that, uh, can I help you? I said, no, I'll, I'll uh, wait for the other person to be available. And then when I came to that Muslim, which I wanted to deal with because he or she was a Muslim, and I began negotiating, I found that there is nobody who would take advantage of me more than that Muslim. Sometimes from small things and sometimes from larger things, sometimes on an ethical level, sometimes on a business level. I've heard it very frequently said that if I need to buy a house, I'm not going to have a real estate agent from the community. They should give me a discount, but I found out that they're charging me full price or, heaven forbid, they're taking a little bit more than the fair price, more than the average going rate. So sometimes we have that complaint. And we all may know people who become somewhat alienated from their community because of these types of interactions. Now they're anecdotal. For every one believer that you might have a complaint about, I can show you one believer who works and earns money just so they can support a worthy cause. Not because they have any economic need, not because they want to go and live a more luxurious life, but simply because they want to be able to help a worthy cause. For every one negative example that you can find, you can find more than one good example. So that principle is not something that we should generalize. It's not a valid way to look at our community. But sometimes it feels that way. Because those who do good often don't care to advertise it. Or others also don't care to recognize it and let others know. But when somebody does something wrong, then we'll write that Yelp review or that review on Fabiha.com. Don't go to this restaurant. Their service was horrible. We will often publicize things that are negative far more than things that are positive. It's a good thing to learn from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says that if you do a good deed, I will reward you ten times. And if you do an evil deed, I'll punish you once. We often are on the reverse. If somebody does something bad to us, we'll tell ten people. And if somebody does something good to us, we might remember to tell one person. Probably we won't tell anybody. We might even forget to thank that person as that person is due. Allah says that if you intend to do a good deed, then it's written for you. But the intention to do an evil deed is not written for us. If somebody intends to do good for us, we don't give them any credit. But if somebody looks at us with a frown, then it's as if they've already done something to personally attack us. So we should learn from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way that He says He treats us and the way that we want Him to treat us. That is how we should treat our fellow believers. But sometimes it is true. There is a believer and that person is harsh. There is a believer and that person's character is not as ideal as we would like. That question was asked from our fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salatu was salam. مَا بَالُ الْمُؤْمِنِ أَحَدُّ شَيْءٍ what is it about the believers? Sometimes they're so strict, so harsh. أَحَدُّ شَيْءٍ And the Imam says that لِأَنَّ عِزَّ الْقُرْآنِ فِي قَلْبِهِ وَمَهْضَ الْإِيمَانِ فِي صَدْرِهِ That believer is always thinking about the Qur'an وَهُوَ عَبْدٌ مُطِيعٌ لِلَّهِ وَمُصَدِّقٌ لِرَسُولِهِ that person is always thinking about being a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, serving Islam, obeying the command of God, is always concerned about the ideals of the Qur'an. That believer has opened his or her heart to certain spiritual realities and certain ideals that are far and away above just the petty concerns of this world. You might sometimes have seen that in your own life, it's easy to be carefree if you don't have anything to worry about. Sometimes 
You have children who are racking up very high bills in college, and they'll take it easy in their classes. I took an incomplete because I didn't really feel like I could finish that class. Meanwhile, their parents are taking out a second mortgage, working extra hours, cutting back on their own needs in order to fund that education. So now, is it fair to say that this child is so carefree, so happy-go-lucky, such good character? I said that, will somebody accompany me for a weekend trip? And they said, yeah, I'll take an incomplete in the class. I'll finish it up in the summer. I'll graduate a semester later or a year later. I'll change my major. No big deal. And you come to the parent and you say something similar and they say, why are you going for that trip? What are you doing? Do you have your classes prepared for? Do you have all of your obligations taken care of? Which one is the better character? It's easy to be happy-go-lucky if your only concerns are superficial concerns. لِأَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ Quran فِي قَلْبِهِ Depth of the Quran is give that believer some credit and give that believer some leeway they are worried about things that are difficult for a human being to easily bear. What about stinginess? Sometimes a believer is stingy. Now, normally we have a hadith that say that you should be very courteous. The hadith I mentioned yesterday, Al-Mu'minu uznuhu fi qalbih wa bishruhu fi wajhih You should have good conduct in your dealings with other people. Similarly, we have many a hadith that say a believer should not be stingy. That bukhl cannot come together with iman. But sometimes a believer is not as freely giving as we might like. And so when Imam Bakr was asked, he justified and defended the believer. He said that, do you know that a believer is concerned about earning their money from a halal source? They're concerned about paying all of their obligations. If their parents are needy, that believer wants to take care of his or her parents. If their children are needy, their parents, their, those believers don't say that's their problem. They want to take care of the needs of their children. They want to make sure that they pay their khums. Because they have such a concern about earning halal rizq and spending halal rizq, sometimes they may not be as stingy or they might not be as generous as you would want. Give them some leeway and give them some credit. If Iman and Qur'an and halal and haram have importance for us, then we will be able to give that leeway and respect to people who are believers. Even if sometimes they have not yet fully worked out their own shortcomings and developed the highest form of ethics. That's not to say that to be a haddu shay'in, to be harsh is good. That's not to say that being a shahu shay'in, to be stingy is good. But it's saying that because iman is so important, because the concerns and the challenges that come in our mind because of iman are so important. Give a believer some leeway and some credit and allow, give them space to grow and develop as a human being. Don't give up on your family. Don't give up on your community. Don't give up on people because of their shortcomings and their weaknesses. That is one of the things that we learn from Ahlul Bayt It seems like a very big deal for me. And some people, they're very happy to say that, you know what, I wish that I had a community of people from this religion because they're so friendly and kind and courteous. Well, friendly and kind and courteous is good. But the wilaya of Ahlul Bayt, the belief in Tawheed, this is what has salvation in the hereafter and in this world. Lahumul bushra fil fil hayat al dunya wa fil akhirah. Lahumul bushra fil hayat al dunya wa fil akhirah. La tabdeel ali kalimat Allah. They are the ones who are going to have good news in this life and in the hereafter. 
and there is no change for the words and for the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that deserves some credit. And this is how you can understand the fact that Ahlul Bayt did not give up on even those people who had disappointed them time and time again. When Imam Hassan responded to the people of Kufa, there were those who said to the Imam that Kufa, the city of Kufa, they did not show loyalty to your father, Amir al muminin They did not show loyalty to your brother, Imam Hassan. They did not show loyalty to those who came before you, and we fear that they will not show loyalty to you either. And Imam Hussain said that, do you think that you know the Kufans better than I know the Kufans? I was there in Jama. I was there in Safi. I was by my brother's side when he was attacked and almost assassinated and barely was able to stay alive on his way to fight Muawiyah. I know the Kufans, but what can I do? They are my Shia. They are the ones who know how evil Muawiyah and Yazid are. What can I do but respond to their call? And if I don't respond to their call, then whose call will I respond to? And he sent for them, not some youth, as some people mistakenly think, but as we heard earlier, very beautifully and very eloquently, Muslim ibn Aqil, the Imam said that, Inni ba'ithun ilaykum, akhi wa ibn ammi wa thiqati min ahli bayti. O oh, Kufans, I am sending to you the very best person I know, my brother, my cousin, and the one I trust in my affairs. This was not just Muslim ibn Aqil, the son of Amir al-Mu'mineen's brother. He was not just a cousin for Imam Hussein. He was also the husband of Imam Hussein's sister, Ruqayya bint Ali. The children of Muslim ibn Aqil were the nephews and nieces of Imam Hussein. He was a trusted and a beloved close person for the Imam. He said to the Kufans, it is as if I am giving you a gift. At this difficult time, I'm sending my thiqah, my trusted one, to be with you. And if you think of the farewells of Ashura, then remember the farewell in Ramadan when Imam Hussein bid farewell to Muslim because he said to him, that I am sending you to a city that is filled with fitna, that is filled with sedition, that is filled with problems. O oh Muslim, I trust that Allah will unite you and me on the path of martyrdom. And then the Imam hugged Muslim and shed tears and said that Muslim, if we do not see each other in this world, then we will join each other in the hereafter. The Imam bid farewell to Muslim, but he knew where he was sending him. He knew that as an ambassador represents his country, Muslim was worthy to represent Ahlul Bayt. Muslim was worthy to represent Imam Hussein. And what a representation it was. There was a Karbala in Kufa. Before the Karbala of Ashura, when Muslim was in Kufa, Hani ibn Urwa, his host was arrested. And Muslim said that we are to begin our mission. We are to begin our movement. O oh, followers of Ahlul Bayt, O oh, thousands of people who, bid your, who pledged your allegiance to me, come and answer my call. And some came and they prayed Maghrib behind Muslim. And then he waited a moment just to do dua and prayed Isha. And when he finished Salatul Isha, he saw that he was alone and there was none with him to the extent that he didn't even know where he could go to bring support and rescue Hani and maybe send a message to his master. He wandered the streets of Kufa as Imam Hussain would wander in the desert of Karbala 
after a few weeks. And then he rested thirsty at the doorstep of an old widow. You know the story of Thoa. She came to her door. She said, that do you not have a family? They must be worried because of this danger that lurks everywhere in Kufa. And the Muslim, he replied, that ma li darin wala ashira. I have no family and I have no house in this city. The lady said, tell me, who are you? I am the ambassador. I am the messenger of my master and my Imam Hussein ibn Ali. So I said that don't go anywhere. You have a home in Kufa. It is a poor lady's house. It is a, the house of a poor woman. But it is your house. Come in. Whatever danger there is, leave it outside and come and I will give you whatever I have at my disposal. That poor lady brought water. She brought food. She brought whatever she had for Muslim. But Muslim did not touch any of the food. He spent that night in ibadah. And as the night came to an end, he closed his eyes for a moment. He saw Amir al-Mu'mineen standing before him, saying, Ya Muslim, Al-Ajal, Al-Ajal, O Muslim, we are waiting for you. I don't know whether it was the sound of Amir al-Mu'mineen that awoke Muslim, or if it was the clang of swords that Muslim awoke. And he said to Thaw'a, that may Allah give you the best reward for your hosting. But it is time for me to do battle. A lone Muslim faced hundreds of drawn swords. And a lone Muslim did battle. The battle of Abu Abdullah al-Hussein in Karbala. And the battle of Muslim in Kufa. This is the ambassador and that is the Imam and what similarity there is. That wherever they would face, the enemy would flee. Until a time came when Muslim was not able to do battle. And he was given a plea of safety. Don't think that he was compelled to accept that aman or that safety. Just like Imam Hussain fell in battle, his ambassador would have fallen in battle. But he had one task left to do. He said, my Imam is coming to Kufa. Because I called him. There were ten members of the household of Ateen with Imam Hussain. There were young children of Muslim. But he wasn't concerned about his wife. He wasn't concerned about his children. He wasn't concerned about his brothers. He was concerned that he had said to the Imam, come to Kufa. And the Imam was on his way. That is why Muslim accepted that offer of safety, not because he wanted to preserve his life. He was taken to Dar al Imara, to the governor's mansion, and as he came, he saw that there was a, some water by the gate. He said, can I have some water? And as he cupped the water in his hand, blood flowed from his mouth, and it made the water bloody. He threw that water and cupped another handful of water. Three times he tried to drink. The third time, in addition to blood, one of his teeth fell into the water. He threw that water away. He said, if it had been God's destiny for me to drink, then I would have drank. But God has destined me to be martyred, thirsty. Because his imam was also going to be martyred, thirsty. Muslim went, and he had no fear. He only said, that if I can make a wasiya for a message to be given to Imam Hussein, and that wasiya, that will, that wish was not granted, Muslim was taken to the roof of Dar al Imara to make an example of him for the people of Kufa. And there, as the sword was raised above his head, he showed his courage. He said, Allahu Akbar, wa astaghfirullah, wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin, wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin Rasulillah. And then he turned towards the direction of Hijaz. He said, Oh my Imam, 
صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله My apologies that I told you to come to Kufa and now Kufa is no longer welcoming. That was the final word of Muslim and Imam Hussain replied and answered that salam on the journey from Hijaz to Kufa without any provocation. The family of the Imam saw that all of a sudden he stood up and then he began to cry and fell to the ground. He said, Wa alayka salam, ya Muslim, inna lillah, wa inna ilayhi rajim.